cars out there that have become the basis for posters seen in bedrooms of young lads up and down the land. The sort of posters that are put up because the cars are exciting, awesome, successful or maybe just a bit avant-garde. Through history there's been Lotus Cortinas, Ford Mustangs, Dodge Chargers, Lamborghini Diablos, Jaguar XJ220s and even things like the Nissan Skyline and Bugatti Veyron have become pasted to the walls of young lads and teenagers bedrooms. And that's just for the road cars. For racing cars that list can get even longer. But when it comes to racing cars being immortalised on a poster, for me nothing comes close to the Lotus 49. And I did say about a week or two ago that Dan Gurney's Eagle is one of the most beautiful racing cars ever built, but for some reason the Lotus 49 goes at the top of the list. Now for reference as to my own personal favourite racing cars, we can also lob in things like the Porsche 919, McLaren MP423 and the Williams FW18. Cars that turn heads, whether that's because of the shape, the colours they were painted in or a combo of the two. But not only did Lotus create a poster car, they also created a blueprint. This story starts in 1966, the start of the 3 litre formula. We already established in another video that Jack Brabham got a head start in the 3 litre formula by handing the Australian engineering company Repco an American V8 engine and then asking them to make it into a Formula 1 engine. For the rest of the grid, it was business as usual. Ferrari and Maserati and later Westlake brought V12 engines because in the words of Enzo himself, aerodynamics are for people that cannot build engines offset any deficiencies in cornering grip by brutally powering past everybody on the straights. But the rest of the grid was mostly V8s, with Climax supplying an inline 4 for a couple of cars. BRM supplied V8s but then went for the unmitigating horror that was their H16 engine. Yes, that's correct, H16. You've got V configuration, W configuration and now we're into the world of H configuration. V engines have the cylinders shaped like a V, W engines have the cylinders shaped like a W, and H engines have the cylinders shaped in, well, an H. Now luckily there's a GIF online of this. Essentially instead of the cylinders being like they are in a V8, V10 or V12, in an H engine you basically have two separate flat engines connected to one output shaft. So while in a normal flat engine you have the pistons staggered, in an H they're directly opposite each other. Now H engines had been used during the Second World War. The Hawker Tempest and Typhoon both had H engines built by Napier and they were pretty powerful engines. But in terms of racing applications, they weren't particularly useful. BRM supplied Lotus with this heavy as hell and high centre of gravity engine for use on the Lotus 43, a car that had been designed around the Lotus 38 that had won the Indy 500 with Clark the previous year. The H16 from BRM was advanced, but when it needed four men to lift it out of the back of the van, they knew that it wasn't going to be particularly good when it came to power to weight. They might as well have just taken a V8 engine. That's actually not true, because it didn't actually produce the power that BRM was claiming that it could produce. If it tried to produce those power numbers, it conked out. It also has to be said here that Clark only used the H16 at Monza, Watkins Glen and Mexico City. Clark drove the Lotus 33 for the first six rounds of the season, powered by a 2-litre V8 Climax engine. This being because Coventry wouldn't build Lotus a 3-litre engine because, well let's be honest, the company was on its last legs and heading towards bankruptcy and developing a Formula 1 engine for the new 3-litre era wasn't a very good business decision on Coventry's end. The company had already been sold to Jaguar and then got merged with another company to become British Motor Holdings which then merged to become British Leyland in 1968 or something, it's very complicated. But still, Clark won the US Grand Prix with this horrendously chonky engine, and I think it's the only time a car with more than 12 cylinders has won a Grand Prix. But in the background, Chapman knew that he needed a new engine. He needed a 3 litre engine that actually worked, and desperate to get one he called two former Lotus engineers, Mike Costin and Keith Duckworth. Now, Chapman knew them anyway because, well, as we've already established, they were former Lotus engineers, but they also had a tuning company that took Ford engines and modified them for use in Lotus road cars. So Chapman called up Costin and Duckworth, and you know, just for simplicity in the storytelling here, we'll just call them Cosworth, and he said to them, hey, can you build me an engine like Repco did for Jack Brabham? Cosworth said, yeah, we could probably do that, but it's going to cost you about a hundred grand. 
While some in Formula 1, particularly of the Italian variety, reckoned 12 cylinders was the way forward, Chapman wanted a V8 because it was light. And since Ford was pretty good at the whole V8 thing, he wanted Ford to help pay the bill for the project. And initially, Detroit said no. So Chapman went to Aston Martin to see what they could do, and they also said no. But then Chapman was sent in the direction of Walter Hayes, who was Ford's UK PR guy at the time. And also remember at this time, Ford had just completed its goal of destroying Ferrari at Le Mans, and might be a bit more open to persuasion to doing it again in Formula 1. Hayes and Chapman had actually known each other for a while because Lotus had worked with Ford to produce the Lotus Cortina. Hayes then took Chapman's plan to Harley Cop, who took it to Ford UK chairman Stanley Gillen, who then got it approved by the head offices in Michigan. The plan was to have a 3-litre V8 engine ready by the May of 1967, but before that they were going to build a 4-cylinder engine for Formula 2. Knowing that he'd have an engine for 1967, Chapman went back to the development of the 1967 car, a car that was going to be simple and lightweight, using the same monocoque construction as the cars that came before it, going all the way back to 1962. Today you'd hear the monocoque being called the safety cell. Everything is bolted to that one bit of the car. This new Ford engine would be bolted to the chassis and then the gearbox hooked to the engine and the rear suspension connected to the gearbox. The engine being connected to the chassis in four places meant that the car was as rigid as dried Weetabix while also being lighter than the other cars around it. The engine was not just an engine, but it was a stress-taking structural part of the car. It meant less bodywork required and now it's a design standard for a Formula 1 car. And it must be mentioned here that Lotus wasn't the only team to do this. The BRM of 1966 also used the engine as a stress taker and in 1954 Lancia had tried it with the D50. The new season started at Kyle Army in South Africa on New Year's Day 1967 and Lotus had turned up with the 1966 car powered by that awful BRM H16 engine. As you can imagine, both Hill and Clark retired and Hill had actually been hired by Lotus at the behest of Ford. It was part of the, the new engine deal. But then going into Monaco, Clark was given a Climax V8, which was just the old two litre engine that wasn't particularly powerful, but you know, it's Monaco, but still the results weren't there. It wasn't until Zandvoort, round three of the season, and about a month later than anticipated, that this new car and new engine turned up. And this new engine contained three letters that changed Formula One forever. D, F, V. Hill and Clark both loved how the car handled through the corners, but they had some concerns about the engine. It was powerful, maybe a bit too powerful as it was like operating an on-off switch. Clark's smooth style couldn't cope with the DFV because it decided to dump all its torque around 6,500 revs, and this meant that Clark was now in a position where he'd have to adapt his driving style. He now needed to be on the power sooner and longer. That car in Zandvoort's spec was putting out around 400 horsepower and would gain power as the years went on. In terms of torque, it was giving the car something in the region of about 220 pound foot or 300 newton meters at that 6,500 mark. The dry weight of the engine was just 168 kilos or 370 pounds, and the overall car was just over 500 kilos. The power to weight of the car must have been insane. By my calculations, it puts it somewhere in the region of 730 horsepower per tonne. Hill started on pole for the race, but Clark had issues and could only start 8th. When the race started, Clark managed to get his head around driving the car and worked his way to the front, while Hill retired with a broken camshaft. Clark went on to win the race by 23 seconds, with Jack Brabham, Denny Holm and Chris Heyman in behind, and won the first race for Lotus and their brand new bespoke engine. After the race, Lotus stripped the engine down and found that the timing belt was damaged, but probably due to Clark being Clark, it managed to finish. With Clark and Hill having the only two engines made so far, they needed to look after them, and Cosworth and Lotus needed to get them working together. Clark and Hill then had problems at the Le Mans Bugatti circuit for the French Grand Prix, but Clark would then win again at Silverstone. Clark managed to nurse the car to the finish and win four of the nine races the car was used at. Hill could only finish two the Canadian and US Grand Prix. And at that US Grand Prix, it was a 1-2 for Lotus and was probably the one result Chapman needed given that the top boss from Ford were there that day. Hill was supposed to win the race, but he had clutch issues and Clark, ever the gentleman, slowed to allow Hill to keep the lead. But because Chris Amon's Ferrari was catching, Chapman told Clark to take the lead, but Amon's bad luck happened for the millionth time and Lotus took the 1-2 anyway. 
It's said that after the race, Clark apologised to Graham, and that Clark at one point was told to speed up, because if he had slowed down to let Graham back through after Eamon retired, it would have looked like Lotus and Ford were taking the piss. But having seen how good this new engine was, Walter Hayes realised that Ford was onto something, and Cosworth for that matter, and they could potentially make a lot of money together. Now Chapman had exclusivity throughout 1967 with the DFV, and after some gentle persuasion, Walter Hayes managed to convince Chapman to give up that exclusivity for 1968, so that Ford, you know, already dominating Le Mans with the GT40, could potentially dominate Formula 1 with the DFV, and really stick the knife into the back of Ferrari. And the first person to get a phone call saying, hey, would you like to buy one of these, was Ken Tyrrell. And Ken actually put an advert in a London newspaper saying, if you give me the £7,000 needed to buy this Cosworth DFE, I will guarantee that Jackie Stewart drives the car. Ken got his seven grand, and Jackie Stewart drove the car. Lotus would enter the car again for 1968, and the issues with the DFV had largely been ironed out but it still wasn't perfect. Clark took the race win in South Africa, but he would be killed at an F2 race in Hockenheim before the season got properly going. This same year, Lotus started selling advertising space on the cars and also trialled adding wings to the car to produce downforce and more grip for higher cornering speeds. There were some problems as this high rear wing was bolted to the rear suspension and it kept breaking and flying off. Lotus would also experiment with fitting the wings lower on the car, so the cars started to resemble the sort of thing seen at the start of the 1970s. The Type 49B would win the Drivers and Constructors Championships, which after the death of Clark is kind of a what could have been, as well as quite fitting. The car is also the holder of a unique record, as Graham Hill is the only person to win the Monaco Grand Prix two years in succession in the same car. The car was adapted and upgraded through the 1969 season as well, but Lotus could only finish third in the standings that year as the other teams started to catch up with their own supply of DFVs and also the drop off in reliability for the team as it went back to the old Lotus ways. That same season was marred by three major accidents, the first two coming at the same event, the 1969 Spanish Grand Prix. Jochen Rind and Graham Hill both crashed as their rear wings failed and Rind broke his nose. Later that season, Graham Hill would have a massive accident at Watkins Glen in which he broke both of his legs. And when asked if he would like to pass on a message to his wife who was back home in England, Graham apparently said, tell her I won't be dancing for a couple of weeks. But despite being the car that became the blueprint for everything that came after it, the Lotus 49 wasn't that dominant. At least, not in the same way that cars like the MP44, FW14B, F2004 or the W10 were. In both 1967 and 1968, it scored four wins. In 1969, it scored just two. Now in those days, there were drop scores and other cars retiring more often, which probably helped, but looking at the results online, there are more DNFs in the boxes than ones with gold backgrounds. But despite this, it remains one of the most important racing cars ever devised, and one of the most beautiful looking Formula 1 cars ever built, and driven by two of the most complete drivers the world has ever seen. It makes you wonder what it would have done if it had been blessed with 2022 F1 car reliability, really. And because of the Lotus design becoming the standard for F1 cars, the FIA had to change their initial proposals of the 2014 engines from an inline 4 to a V6. So then, a look at the beautiful, epic and important Lotus 49. If you've learned something here today, then do give the video a thumbs up so the algorithm can do its thing. And if you want to see more stuff like this, then get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out on anything I do around here. Big up to the people of Patreon for the support, and if you want to help out with buying up historic images for these videos, you can help out by hitting the link in the description, as well as finding links to Instagram and, you know, what's left of Twitter. If you don't want to do monthly Patreon stuff, there is super thanks down there too if you just want to top up my coffee cup. So until next time, I've been Aidan Millward. Have a great day wherever you live in the world and I'll see you all again soon for another video. Or I could see you tomorrow because I'm commentating once again on the GP Laps Historic Road Racing League, this time from the Targa Florio. So if you're interested in that, you know, you can join me tomorrow or you can join me the next time I put up a video like this. So until that next time, goodbye.